So people at home can hear me. Oh, wow, people in the room can hear me now, too. This is exciting because it is 12.15 or 3.15, my time, Eastern. Um, welcome to the power and the pitfalls of publishing. I am Mark Leslie Lefebvre. Uh, I'm the director of business development at draft to digital Been an author, podcaster, book nerd for my entire life. Just uh, a little bit about who I am, but basically, in a nutshell, I've worked in the industry since 1992, so I'm celebrating 30 years this year. Been a writer since I was a kid, I'll get into that a little bit later. Been a bookseller since 1992, worked in almost every kind of bookstore imaginable. Currently working at the ebook company, of course, and have held many, many positions over the years. Uh, one of the things I want to talk about before we get into the power of what we have today as indie authors and the pitfalls, I want to throw up an earworm um, is how did I get here? Um, letting those days go by. Um, it's not just a fun earworm, but understanding how we got to where we are today is a really important element for understanding the power that we now possess as creative people and the potential pitfalls by having access to some of that power. Because we have some access to some of that power without the restrictions. And I'm also going to share with you that as, even though it's amazing and awesome and exciting all the things we can do, it's the same as it ever was. And again, I hope that puts an old a talking heads earworm in your head. I just want to give you a quick, uh, super brief history of publishing. And this is where it comes back from. And Craig talked about this on the first day. He talked about that beautiful connection between reader and writer, which is what we have. And we have it so intimate today. And it hasn't been this intimate since perhaps oral storytelling, since perhaps there was one village storyteller who could share a tale and had that creativity and people would gather around. And the beauty of this, and this is a beauty we understand today, is that you can react to what the readers love, right? It's not divided by a bunch of people in New York making that decision. You can produce stuff at the will of your readers and get feedback from them and understand and give them exactly what they want. But it started off that way. And then it became a little bit more magic that if the storyteller wasn't around, they learned how to write. They learned how to put things down. They could actually scribe. They could write this stuff down. And that other magic could happen is somebody else could pick it up and read it at another time. Now, back then, not a lot of people could read. And so it had to be someone in the village who could read that aloud. And it was still or oral storytelling. But it was also still limited. It limited uh, access. So as creators, as writers, as storytellers, we didn't have as many options. Readers didn't have as many options. It wasn't really until the evolution of movable type, uh, Gutenberg's printing press, that books kind of took on a whole new expansion, which meant more expansion and more opportunities for writers. And that was really, really critical, because at each step in the evolution of publishing, there were more opportunities for readers and more opportunity for writers. Now, yes, it wasn't just limited to a bunch of monks who could write some scrolls and people who could read the scrolls. It now went into large mass production, but it was still hardcover. It was still very, very expensive. It wasn't until the invention of the mass market paperback that books became more affordable. More people could afford books. That also heralded a whole new, wonderful dynamic of pulp fiction. And writers could write. More writers could write. That was a, a, a great boon in the industry. Of course, you could write genre niches and things like that and really appeal to the stuff that people wanted. And, 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 and of course, this is where I slip in a little self-promotional slide of some pictures of people that I've taken from just you know, one, one of those books from Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. But this is just the whole idea is that you could have niche book, niche books with pulp and mass, mass market. We're seeing that same thing today in digital pulp. And we, and we have even bigger niche markets because we can reach more people than just mass market production. But just because we have those unique niches, just because you can dig into all the things you want, does not take away from the excitement and the joy and the thrill and the, and the pageantry and the celebration of authors. We're all authors here today. You know, 2,000 people here gathered in Vegas to share and lift each other up and help each other out. But the average person, to the average person, I should say, you're a pretty big deal. And that's something that you shouldn't forget in terms of the fact that you're an author. So even though we have the niche genres and the pulp fiction and the digital pulp, you still have that pageantry. So the next big phase in publishing was not until online book selling, when suddenly you can get access to books. The, the town I grew up in, the library was attached to the public school, 2,000 people in the town. 
I couldn't even get access to books. It was an hour drive to get into the nearest bookstore. But in an age of the internet, in the age of Amazon, where you can get books delivered to your door, think about what that did in terms of expanding the book industry and expanding. And we all know what pl platforms like Amazon and all the other online retailers have been able to do for us. Of course, the next phase, the biggest phase, the phase that really allows 20 books to be what it is today is ebooks and digital. Because like that pulp, it's like 1,000 times larger in all the niche genres that you could decide to write in. And you did not have to be beholden to someone in New York publishing. We removed the gatekeepers. We allowed ourselves to be able to connect directly with readers. And, and again, it's almost as intimate as it was when that village storyteller was there. What's next? There's so much more, there's so many things. We can't even predict what the next year is gonna bring. Next year when we gather again in Vegas, what are the new technologies that we're gonna be able to leverage? The one thing I wanna encourage you is to be open and accepting, as open as accepting as you were of the possibility that you could upload and sell your eBooks directly on retail platforms as opposed to having to wait for permission from someone in New York. There will be opportunities, there will be things that we can leverage. Look at how you can embrace and incorporate that and move forward. And we're always gonna have to deal with that change. Because again, when the scroll was replaced by Gutenberg's printing press, that was not a cause for alarm and the world is ending. That was a cause for something that Mitch Joel, Canada's Seth Godin says, everything is with rather than instead of. It adds to it. It adds to all of that. So the book didn't die, and a lot of people decried that when the ebooks came around that the book was dead. It, it just had babies. It was just new generation, new ways to appreciate it. In fact, and this is something we don't talk about enough in our industry, is that the reason that a lot of us indie authors believe that publishers don't know what they're doing and they have their heads up their rear ends is because they're invested in an age-old business of shipping dead trees around. And believe it or not, that is a very, very profitable business. They're not interested in selling ebooks. Their ebook pricing is interested in driving people back to the print books. And most people who read still read print books. So if you're killing it, if you're knocking it out of the park in ebooks, just remember there are a lot more people who still read print. There's a lot more people to discover ebooks. You think about the heyday? Oh my God, remember the Kindle Gold Rush days of 2010 to 2012? We haven't even seen the tip of the iceberg for ebook reading. It's not over. It's merely the beginning of a 25, 30 year transformation of the industry. But print books will not go anywhere. So if you're not taking advantage of print books, because you can for free in many, many ways, go ahead and take advantage of that. Even though every ebook is a large print book, there's a lot of readers that are not going to read ebooks to get large print. They're going to need a physical one. Well, thank goodness for Atticus and Vellum and other tools that will allow you the ability to get into large print relatively easily. All of this came with the reconceptions of what self-publishing could actually be, because it wasn't about rejection, it was about choice, and it was about taking control. Because when done correctly, as we all know, you know the optimal self and self-publishing is self-directed. And obviously we know as indie authors, we're the publisher, we, we're in charge of hiring, we're in charge of all the decisions. Doesn't mean we don't do those things, we just have to take the role of what the publisher would have done in those cases. And we've adopted the term indie author to remove ourselves from that negative connotation, self-publishing and vanity publishing. But it's also a recognition by which our industry has grown, especially in the last 10 years. And this is really exciting when you think about this. Because indie authors have been evolving in the exact same way that those big New York publishers evolved back in the day. When you think about places like LMBPN and Wordfire Press and all of these, so many other uh, outfits out there, authors who are not only publishing their own books, but helping their friends and working together and working collaboratively to publish. LMBPN did start off as Michael Anderley's books and that he was publishing on his own. And now they've got a, a little publishing empire and they hired Robin Cutler who's worked in the industry longer than I have and, and is now in charge of that publishing. And I'm sure you heard her on the stage um, yesterday talking about that and working with authors, doing all the cool things that a traditional publisher does, but with the adeptness and the dynamic nature of indie publishing, the best of both worlds. But I want to kind of share 
1927, Bennett Chirp and Donald Knopfler were a couple of friends who loved reading, they were passionate, and they really wanted to publish books that they were excited about, and they said we were gonna publish a few books on the side at random. That became Random House, world's largest publisher. Speaking of the world's largest publisher, it was, it was the mass market paperback and the Pulp Fiction and all that. Penguin was, Penguin was part of that revolution by making inexpensive, more affordable paperbacks. We actually think of Penguin now as, when you look at the Penguin logo, you think of high literary classics, you think of high, but they were trying to reduce the price of books to make them accessible to more people. Ironic, isn't it, that a big publisher was trying to reduce the price of books as opposed to increase them? But that, is, that was part of niche publishing. That was trying to experiment with pricing. And Lincoln, um, Lincoln Schuster's aunt used to love doing the crossword puzzles. And she was so frustrated because she could only do them on Sunday, New York Times, once, once a week. And she could do them every day. She loved crossword puzzles. So Richard and his friend Lincoln got together and remortgaged the house and decided to invest in a publishing company that would do nothing but crossword puzzle books. That became Simon and Schuster. So when you think about all of the dynamic and awesome publishers that are coming out of indie publishing today, they're driven by the same passion, they're driven by the same experimentation, they're driven by the same access to niche markets and trying to fulfill a gap. And that's gonna continue to grow and that's why it's the same as it ever was. We're just doing it in a different way. We're embracing the new technologies to make those things happen and that's how publishing continues to grow and evolve and become something better. My writer journey I'm gonna share with you really quickly. I'm gonna share my first love. It's a very intimate moment between all of us. My very first love, there she is, Underwood typewriter. I'm that old, yes. I used to type these manuscripts out. This is, this is me, uh, the Underwood typewriter. That's my loving Baba, my grandmother, who used to come in and say, you're too skinny. <laughs> Not anymore, but I was too skinny. I was too pale. As I was working on this, Conan the Barbarian, I guess you would call it fan fiction based on the Marvel comics and the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie and the Dungeons and Dragons. You know, that was my first form of early research to make sure I got the monsters right. <laughs> Wrote a horrible novel. I thought it was an epic fantasy. It was probably 30,000 words, but it was long for me because I spent my 14th, the year of the 14th in summer writing this book. But this was back when you used to mail manuscripts and wait six to nine months for a rejection to come in the mail. Every once in a while, of course, there was cause for celebration because every once in a while you would actually sell a book to a publisher of the story. But what would happen is the average was for every 13 submissions, you would get a rejection. And that wasn't 13 submissions in a month and I would get all my rejections. This could take years. This is an insane process when I think about how long it would be because there was no internet, it was just mail. So the interesting thing about those days of rejection is that we can now bypass those gatekeepers in publishing. But here's where rejection happens nowadays. Rejection doesn't happen in a slush pile from a New York publisher. Rejection happens in an on online catalog near you because we can put the manuscripts up and the rejection is in the form of nobody buys it, nobody sees it, nobody knows about it. So we're all struggling and frustrated with marketing and connecting with the right readers. Rejection can also, of course, come in the guise of one-star reviews, and those one-star reviews can come from the fact that we sometimes push that publishing button a little bit too fast, because we're excited to share that beautiful story we wrote, and we don't bother to have it edited properly. We don't bother to get the right cover on. But that is where rejection can happen. The good news is, is you can change, you can adapt, you can grow, you can try again. I'm gonna share some of that a little bit later. But indie publishing and traditional publishing share the very same thing, and that's the 80-20 rule. And, that, and this is the, the God's honest truth, is that 20% of the books that are published represent 80% of the volume. Yes, you can make way more money if you embrace indie publishing. It doesn't mean everyone's going to make way more money. But the possibility exists, and there are some pitfalls that you can potentially avoid to help you get to that because we've never had so much power, we've never had so much choice. But the thing I wanna remind you, you're hearing and seeing so many great ideas here. You're probably only gonna be able to absorb and maybe adapt one or 2% of the cool things you see. That's okay, because you will potentially have heard something this week that you may adapt in two years. And, and I didn't say you're going to do, but you're gonna adapt, you're gonna morph it into something that works for you, not for me, not for anyone else who shared it, because you're gonna get an idea and it's gonna grow and evolve 
is something that's going to work with you. Because there are risks and pitfalls that come with having these choices and bypassing the gatekeepers. And one of the best things about this industry, and I was talking uh, with a friend last night about this, is that this is the most remarkable industry when you think about it. As I spray spit across the stage, that was just lovely. I hope I didn't get you guys in the front row. But we're here sharing the success and what we did. In no other industry do people say, I have the solution. I figured out the algorithm. I've, I've in, encountered this thing, and I'm going to share it with you to help you be as successful because the rising tides and the all boats as we all lift and hold one another up, and that is something that is as frustrating and as isolating as being a writer can be. Don't ever forget that there are other people out there that feel what you feel, that if they are successful, remember what it was like and are there to help you. And that's something that we can always return to. And we, and we feel it really strong when we're here, but next week when we're back home, we're gonna have a little bit of a downtime and sometimes that little go down a little bit too much because of the joy and excitement and all the cool people you got to hang out with today. But that's the reality is we're here to help each other out. But the thing I, I also want you to not forget is we are merely one silo of what's possible. And this is a big group. You know, the 20 Books group is, is what, 25,000 people on the Facebook group. It's 2,000 people in person and probably another 800 or so watching live as we're doing this. We're merely one silo of the industry. Just like traditional publishing is very siloed and they don't really know what we're doing over here in indie publishing, there's so many individual silos of things going on. And that's okay. You're never going to be a part of it all. Just remember that sometimes we can get that myopic view and forget that there's other possibilities and we can just look. And that's one of the cool things about bringing in different speakers and listening to them and understanding, oh, well, they do it that way, I do it this way. We can learn and we can grow and we can adapt. One of the biggest risks about this week and the things that we do in the sharing online is sometimes there's just so much information. And where do you even begin? And I would argue that you begin with where you can. You begin with the thing that seems to fit right now. You're going to have a list of 20, 30, 40 things you want to do. You may get two or three, or even only one of them done, but you're one step closer to that goal. Don't beat yourself up if you don't readapt everything. Every time I see Tammy Lebrecht speak, she was just on stage before me, every time I see her speak, I learn something awesome and new, and I make about a dozen notes of how I'm going to improve my newsletters. I usually only do about one every single time, but every single time I do it, I remind myself that that's one step closer to following some of the advice and some of the awesomeness that she's sharing with us. And sometimes when we have too much choice, it actually stops us. It prevents us from moving forward because we look at the list and we're overwhelmed, and that's a big pitfall. We often always fall into, particularly when we all get home from an awesome conference like this. And that's why it's really, really important to go back and, and think about you and your business and your very specific goals and what you need, not what I need, not what anyone else needs, what you need, what you want, and reminding and, and using that as a, as a touch base. That'll help ground you. That'll help you when you look at those 40 things. What can I do first? What should I do first? How does this tie back to my goals? Priorities, of course, are really important. I'm going to talk about that. But I have a quote that I've used uh, by my writing desk, and it stays there, and it's been there for about 20 years now, is if the desire to write is not accompanied by actual writing, then the desire is not to write. If, you, if it is a priority, you make it happen. And that's one of the potential pitfalls, is we sometimes fall on the wrong priorities, and I'm going to talk about that. At a very high level, there's a free book you can get from marklesley.ca slash... 20 books, 7P, and it's the seven Ps of publishing success. So I'm just going to highly outline this. This is just the tracking I've done with both traditional publishing and self-publishing is practice, is writing, is continuing to write. It's professionalism. It's behaving like a professional in the industry. And that's just in the craft of writing as well as in the business and the operations that you do. It's patience. It's that it could be 10 years later. It could be that it's going to take a long time to find the right audience, and you keep working at it, and you don't give up. But constantly learning, constantly growing, coming to conferences like that, learning from one another, progressing in the craft, being persistent about that, not giving up despite the hardships that come. Partnership is critical. We're here. We're all here. We're sharing. We're in the same boat together, and we're helping each other out. 
but the partnerships can happen with your editors. Partnerships happen with your readers. You're all part of a collaborative team. And that leads to patronage, and I'm not necessarily talking about Kickstarter and Patreon, but I am as well. The different ways that patronage is very important to our success, right? We need people to read our books. We need people to review our books. We need people to talk to about our books. These are all part of those collaborative efforts that we work together on. But the uh, publishing pitfalls. I think the, f the first one, and it's really hard to get over, and, and I know it's probably well known, but I just want to reiterate is that you're proud of your book. It's an awesome book. You love it. But your book isn't for everyone. It's really, really important to remember that. I write, I write horror. A lot of the stuff I write is not going to appeal to most readers. Uh, you know, I mean, if I wanted to sell more, I'd probably write romance. But my passion, my heart isn't in writing those books. I'm not good at doing that. I prefer the other thing. So when somebody's talking to me and I find out that they're a romance reader, well, I have friends who write really amazing romance novels. I would rather direct them to buy that person's book, and everyone has a good experience, as opposed to they feel bad and they buy my horror novel, and they go, wow, this, this scared me and I don't like it, and I'm gonna give it a one-star review, and I tell everyone Mark Leslie sucks. So again, remembering that not, our books aren't for everyone, and as excited as we are about them, is the person that we're trying to pitch it to is not excited about it, we wanna move on and find something they are excited about so we can prop up our friends or fellow authors. And that means, Spending that time trying to sell and pitch to the wrong people is like a really frustrating pitfall that we often fall into, is we just keep pushing, we keep pushing, and that's persistence in the wrong way, as opposed to persistence and keep working at something. Because, you know, my mom, the only time she ever read my horror novels was when the power was out and she had nothing better to do. And well, that's not the thing I wanted, right? She's not my ideal reader because she was a romance reader. That's what I preferred, so I would always buy books of friends of mine to give to her. It's just very high level look at target audience. This is an example of a, of a book I pitched to a traditional publisher. Haunted Hamilton, True Ghost Stories of Hamilton, Ontario. It was like three different demographics. People who love ghost stories was one of them. People who love the city of Hamilton, they're proud of their hometown. They're connected some way into that hometown. And people who love history, because you can't tell a good ghost story without digging into history. And so the pitch to the publisher was that this is a book that's going to appeal to people who cross over in all three of those aspects. It doesn't mean you're not gonna sell the book to people who just love ghost stories, because they may buy any ghost story book, but the ideal reader, the targeted, very niche ideal, is that crossover. So anytime you're thinking about your book, I, I'm a visual uh, learner, so I like the Venn diagram. I just start sketching it out, and that's, that's what I do. And then I think about comp titles, these people who would have read these books, people who would have experienced this, that's another thing, because you want, when you think about the pitch, you want to think about what problem does, the, does that book solve for your target audience, for the ideal reader. And often the problem is just finding an entertaining book to read or the next thing that's going to escape, take them away. Obviously a lot easier for nonfiction. What problem does Tammy Librecht's newsletter Ninja solve? Well, we know what that one is pretty obvious, but what problem does my ghost story book solve other than I like to read ghost stories and I like ghost stories like this? And then how will it help? So how will it help? The retailer I'm publishing it. Um, I'm publishing it to. How will it help the, the bookstore I want to try and carry it? The library. Well, it may help them because, you know, it's a thriller and James Patterson thrillers are $15.99 in ebook, but mine are $4.99. It actually helps them because the reader can buy three books of mine for the price of one traditionally published book. That's a pretty great problem to solve. But I've also read all of the big publisher titles, who do I read next? Oh boy, do we ever have something for you? Because not only do I have some good books, but I have some friends who have some good books because chances are those avid readers are gonna keep reading and keep reading. But then potentially do not forget your voice, your unique take on it. Yes, it's a thriller. Yes, it's a romance. Yes, it's a this. But I'm the one who shared this and there's something special about you and your unique voice in that book. The other thing to remember is that we think of books, we think of ebooks, we think of formats. That's just one way that that IP is represented through a business of publishing. But you own it, you decide how to license it, you decide if you're gonna be exclusive to Amazon, you decide if you're gonna publish it wide, you decide what formats, you decide if you wanna license it to a publisher, you decide if you wanna do all the things with it, territorial, territorial rights and all of the different things you can do with it. If you are signing a contract with a publisher, be aware it's a negotiation. This contract is a negotiation where you are each giving 
and receiving something of value. You can change it, it can, it's malleable. You can ask for changes. You don't have to let the power dynamic be, oh, this publisher is being so nice to me that they're going to publish my book. And if you do work with a publisher, don't let that take away from the fact that you can still independently publish. Because if, you only, if they only purchased North American rights, you can still leverage all the tools that are freely available for you for self-publishing to publish it. If you sell short fiction, the rights usually revert back to you. What can you do with it? And where else can you exploit that IP? In your newsletter, can you share some of the research or deleted scenes or the things that didn't make it into a book? Those are really, really important. The biggest fear, the thing I hate the most about this industry, and if you've ever heard David Gogren talk, he's really adamant about this. Mark Coker as well, founder of Smashwords, hates the predators that prey on the hopes and dreams of writers, and there's so many in our industry who prey on the fact that we just want to get our books out there, we just want readers to find them. And they lie to us, they tell us they're gonna give us marketing, they tell us all kinds of promises, outright blatant lies. There are thousands and thousands of predators in our industry. Some of them are adapting the term hybrid publisher because we're using hybrid, I call myself a hybrid author because I traditionally publish and I self-publish. And they use hybrid because it sounds legit, but hybrid means you have to pay to publish. Now there are good hybrid publishers if that's your goal, if that's your desire, because they can take away some of the questions and how do I do this and how do I find an editor? But just be aware that some of them will deceive you and try to trick you into paying another $10,000 for a marketing package that's not really gonna do much. We're gonna tweet your book. Oh great, thanks. It's not gonna help me. Things to watch out for is if they call themselves a traditional publisher, promises up front, you can't promise anything. Look at the DOJ, look at what was going on with the New York publishers. All of these brilliant people who've worked decades and decades in the industry and they still can't figure out, apart from a few of the top sellers that they know they're, they're you know, the Stephen Kings of the world, et cetera, they don't know if it's gonna be a book that's gonna make the money or not. So nobody can promise that something's going to be a bestseller. Uh, partnership, hybrid publisher, joint venture, co-op can be things to, to look out for. Uh, if they reach out to you, <laughs> it's also something like when someone shows up and knocks on my door and says, hey, it's usually good for them, not necessarily for me. Um, avoiding reasonable questions. If you actually get a contract and you ask for changes and they completely refuse adamant, no legitimate publisher is going to not consider your changes in the contract. Uh, distribution, actual distribution, physical distribution rather than just print on demand. We can all do print on demand. What are you going to do for me? Are you actually gonna get my book into bookstores or is it just gonna be exactly what I can do for myself? And pressure, oh well you have to do it now or else it's gonna be gone next week. Those are the kinds of the things. If you go to Writer Beware run by the SFWA, if you're a member of the Alliance of Independent Authors, check it out. They actually have listings of, of predators <laughs> to look out for. Easy enough to find those. Um, but again, uh, don't, you can Google them uh, as well and see people who shared experiences. Now, the other thing that we often do is we often pounce on trends. Now, I know TikTok's awesome and I have fun with it. I, uh, James did a talk yesterday on TikTok which was absolutely amazing and inspiring and I'm gonna take away probably half a dozen things, maybe do one or two of them. But we have these cool things and we have Instagram, we have Booktube, and we have all these things that people talk about that they do that's really awesome. And sometimes it works for them and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes we end up spending so much time dreaming about those lottery tickets of what this is gonna be. If I only do this, I'm going to be successful. And I think that's one of the challenges because when we pounce on trends, when we end up spending all of our time on social media and distracted by those things with the hopes that we're gonna be the next viral sensation, that can actually take us away from what's most important, which is probably the writing. And oftentimes, the people who are successful are not the people who think of it as broadcast, but people think of social media as community. And if you're actually enjoying yourself, and you're actually engaging, and you're actually getting some intrinsic value from it, that's kind of cool. Just make sure it doesn't take too much away from the business of what you're doing as a writer. Don't just follow what other people are doing be yourself and do the things that work really, really well. If it's not comfortable, why are you wasting your time doing it? If you're having fun, 
and you're enjoying it, and it's making you feel good, and it's, for me, sometimes it's a writing warm-up exercise to exercise my creativity for 15 minutes, create some content, put it out there. I had fun doing it. It's not gonna help me sell books, but boy, I got a nice warm-up out of it, and I sold some books maybe one day, maybe not, but I'm part of a community, and I enjoy that. Um, and you're not gonna be able to do it all. You're gonna hear see, and see things and, and just go, well, I gotta do this, I gotta do that. Well, do you got to do it? Or how does that fit in your plan and your goals? The other thing that frustrates me a lot is the following the pack. And it started off, I remember, John Locke was the first author to really make it big by selling hundreds of thousands of his book, ebook, which wasn't very well edited. I mean, it wasn't bad, but it, again, back then you could do that for 99 cents. And then suddenly everyone's like, well, if I just make my book 99 cents, I'll be successful. It's kind of like, have you ever seen a, a group of 10-year-olds playing soccer? Instead of people playing their position, you see the ball go this way, and everyone moves to the left, and then the ball goes that way, and everyone moves to the right. The only kid having fun is the kid with the ball, the first kid to get the ball. But here's the cool thing, and this is, this is where I bring up my Canadianism, as I say, why was Wayne Gretzky one of the most successful hockey players ever? Because he didn't follow the puck. He skated to where the puck was going to be. He anticipated that. He was doing his own thing and he was playing a particular position. He wasn't just following the pack. So think about that when you're looking at that next shiny object and all the cool kids are doing this. Does it fit with your position and where you want to be? If it doesn't, skate to where that position should be. And, and that could be one of the ways that you get there. This is an example of packaging being one of the pitfalls. When I first released a Canadian werewolf in New York, I had the wrong packaging. It wasn't a horrible cover, I don't think, but it was targeted to the wrong audience. It wasn't until I actually did some research and study and looked at this with a cover designer and looked at what was selling in the industry and said, oh, now I'm gonna to appeal to an actual urban fantasy uh, target audience. And that was one of the things about packaging. Professionalism is the other area where we, we, we mistake. We can, we can push the buttons, we can do things by ourselves, but we gotta remember it's about relationships. It's relationships with other authors. It's how you treat other authors. It's how you treat the vendors that you are talking to here. People remember how you made them feel. And there, there is a perception, but it's also that professionalism when it comes to growing in the craft and business of writing. The other challenge, and this often happens earlier in your career, is perfection being the enemy of done. Sometimes we just want to write it one more time before we, because we're nervous, we don't want to release it. What if someone reads it? But Seth Godin, uh, I really loved uh, the, the book on the practice because it was about shipping. It was actually delivering, constantly delivering, and it goes back to IT methodology of constantly iterating, breaking things, fixing it, keeping going. Not everything's going to be perfect, but you're gonna learn from those mistakes and you're gonna keep growing, and that's part of the progression. Pricing is another really important thing, but pricing isn't just generic. Every genre has different price points, and different countries have different price points, so understanding and analyzing that rather than just going, well, if I make it 99 cents, I'll be successful. International pricing, we leave money on the table all the time if we don't optimize our prices. We put in a US price and we don't think, well, how does that look in Canada or Australia or somewhere in Europe? How does that look and how does that appeal or not to the global audiences there? And then library pricing versus retail pricing, recognizing that there is a difference and, and there is a way to increase those prices. Free can definitely help sell, and that's a really important aspect. This is a study we had released when I worked at Kobo years ago about this is a six book series, and this is a book one, and this was the trends of six weeks later. How many people downloaded? 12,000 people. How many people actually opened that book in the first six weeks? Most people don't. One of the reasons why a book bub may not work the, may not work the second time is that you may have actually had 10,000 people download the book and then when you run it again six months later, they didn't download it again because they looked at it and they thought, cool, that's neat. Maybe they started reading it. So maybe if, if, even though the, the clicks don't work and it didn't look like you downloaded, you could have actually brought people back to that book they already had on their Kindle or their Kobo or whatever reader they had. Because one of the things that we learned, and this is the cool thing, is how many people read it, uh, read it in the first six weeks? And when you actually looked at the conversion, because when I worked for a retailer, you could see that, you could see who's reading the books, you found that 
the, the free to buy conversion was really low, and so if you're hitting 1.4%, that's actually pretty good, because most people will never open the book, but once they open the book and start reading it, the numbers go up, it goes up to like 10, 11, 12%. In this particular case, 10.7. And then the read to buy conversion in the first six weeks was between 45 and 55%. This, in this particular case, it was 52% of people who got to the end of the book and read one or more books in the rest of the series. So it can help sell, but you can't always trust the numbers. The other thing is imposter syndrome. If you haven't heard James Owen's Eggs Benedict, uh, it, was, it was recorded earlier this week. You can probably watch it online if you didn't already, but it comes down to taking pride in the work that you're doing and the hard work and the effort and all the professionalism you put into your book. It's okay to say my book is pretty awesome for the right readers in the right situation. It's okay, it's not false pride. False humility is where we get into errors and mistakes. And that's something that's really, really important. The other thing I wanna remind people, of, especially if you're new, you've come here and you're like, well, I'm, 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 I haven't had anything published yet. I'm a beginning writer, I'm a wannabe writer, I'm a budding writer. It's like, no, you're a writer. If you're here, if you're watching this online, you're invested in yourself. You're invested in becoming a better writer. You've already put a lot of work into it, even if there are no publication credits, even if you've got something published and you haven't sold anything this month or haven't sold much at all or you don't even have reviews yet. You're a writer. You're not a to-be writer, a soon-to-be writer. Own it, it's okay. You're working hard, you've invested in yourself. Let people see that. Because it's okay to wear it with confidence, whether it's in person, whether it's online. Because again, like I said earlier on, most people think they will write a book one day. Most people will never. You are here, you've invested in yourself. It's okay to take pride. The last thing I wanted to remind you of is, I'm a big fan of Michael Connolly, and he has, uh, Harry Bosch is a character, character, a longest running character he's written, who investigates murders and says everybody counts or nobody counts, it doesn't matter who you are, if I'm gonna find justice for your murder, it doesn't matter who you are, I'm gonna give everyone equal credit. And I will say that here, every single person who's a member of this group, every single person watching, every single person in this entire casino where we are, there's not something you can't learn from them. There's not a single person here I can't learn from there's not a single person here you can't learn from, even if they don't have the same experience because they have different experiences and that can help you grow. So be open to the fact that everybody counts or nobody counts. Yes, take pride in the things you learn. Take pride in sharing the things you learn with other writers, but take pride in knowing that you can learn from every single person you interact with. I do have time, I think, for a couple questions, right? Just a couple minutes, so if there's anyone who has questions, there's a mic right there. If not, if you'd rather talk to me afterwards, I'll just be hanging out at the front of the stage. But I do wanna say, oh, oh there you go. We got, we're gonna have a question, this is exciting. I was gonna say, if you don't ask the question into the mic, I'll ask my own question. Mark, who does your hair? Okay. We have the same hairstylist. I love, I love your hair. <laughs> Back at you. Uh, the question is, what do you think about wide versus exclusive? Okay, good, good question. So uh, I'm, very, I'm very partial to WIDE, obviously. Uh, I wrote a book called WIDE for the Win. <laughs> I'm very active in the WIDE for the Win group, but um, it's not for everyone. Uh, and, and, and if you are exclusive to Amazon and you're making really, really good money, why, why change it if it ain't broke? I worry about what may happen when things change, and I'm always worried about that. And I'm a big fan of multiple diverse sources of income from as many places. Like, and my, mine come from trad publishing and indie publishing and other creativity. Now, the one thing I will say about that, even though I am partial to wide, is sometimes it's so overwhelming. How do we do everything on all the platforms? I don't understand how all the different retailers work. Well, okay, so Amazon's the world's biggest bookstore. Maybe you start there, and it's okay. And, and being exclusive for 90 days is not the end of the world because the magic of being an independent author is you can change it. You can try it and learn. And if it works, great, keep doing it. And then when you're ready to go wide, maybe you only do one retailer and you focus on them for a while. You can still publish everywhere, but learn. Yeah, next question. Uh, 
This is pretty specific, but um, what do you think like the difference benefits of uh, distributing your book to different retailers through like Ingram Spark versus using like BNN Press to publish your book? For you're talking about print books, right? Print books, yeah. Print books. Um, Six of one, half a dozen of another. Because again, you're always going to have to make the decision of whether or not you want to do that. Uh, do you have the time to do it? Are you going to get any benefits by doing it directly? What are the benefits? Those are the questions. We only have 10 seconds, so let's hit her. Let's hit her. In terms of long-term success, you can do one thing and you must not do one thing. What are those two? Ah, we ran out of time. That's a great question. You can come and chat with me and we'll figure it out together. Thank you guys so much.